Seen from space, the Earth looks like a smooth blue globe. There are no visible differences in height between mountains and deep seas. On the Earth itself, however, a seemingly insignificant wrinkle, almost invisible from space, is in fact of enormous size. For a long time, it was thought that these mountains had always been there and that they hardly changed. Now we know that the Earth is alive and that its surface is constantly moving. This so-called tectonic activity contributed in shaping the face of the Earth. Many minerals and ores that occur locally are the result of volcanic activities. These materials have been transported from the depths of the Earth's crust to the surface. Geology is a relatively young science that has proved of great value to mankind. In the study of the movements in the Earth's crust, seismological investigation is an important instrument. A country as widespread as Indonesia, with dozens of active volcanoes and frequent earthquakes, therefore, has a number of seismographic stations to measure such movements. Chains of highly sensitive instruments have been installed to record the slightest tremors in the Earth's crust. By combining seismological data from various locations, their place of origin can be determined. Such earthquake foci are mapped, and in this way, an image can be constructed of regions where parts of the Earth's crust move in relation to each other. A cross-section of the upper part of the Earth's crust shows how this takes place. At certain places on the ocean floor, new crust develops. At other places, it disappears into the deep. This so-called subduction is one of the causes of earthquakes. The heat, deep under the surface, melts the rock into magma, which finds a way out to the surface. Here, the pressure is released, and a new volcano is born, or becomes active after years of being dormant. Rocks are thrust together and pile up slowly until they become mountains. New crust develops in the mid-Atlantic. The mid-oceanic ridges mark the areas where magma rises and the seafloor is spreading. Subductions mainly take place along the edges of the continents. It is characterized by mountain building volcanism, and earthquakes. Indonesia is one of the areas with a lot of tectonic activity. Here, several large segments of the Earth's crust, called plates, move with respect to each other. Geologists have determined that the plates of the Australian continent and the Pacific Ocean slide under the Indonesian archipelago at a speed of seven, respectively, 11 centimeters per year. Research workers of the Snellius II expedition have carried out measurements on various Indonesian islands to ascertain the course of these movements. And today we have visited outcrops along the south coast, quite near uh, Elilinta. And tomorrow we will go somewhat more to... Certain locations receive special attention. It is presumed that they have once broken off of the Australian continent. <laughs> Indonesian vessels take care of transport to sites that are difficult to reach. Frequent changes to smaller boats have to be made so that shallow lagoons can be crossed.
These rocks developed in the sea approximately 150 million years ago. They were formed by the deposition of skeletal remains of billions of microscopic organisms and of sand and clay particles that were transported from the land to the sea by wind and rivers. Gradually, the sediments indurated and in the course of time have emerged above sea level. Most rocks contain iron compounds that have magnetic properties. They can be considered as weak magnets. During the formation of the rocks, the iron molecules, like a needle of a compass, point towards the North Pole. The technique of the investigation is based on the measurement of the direction of fossil magnetization as it formerly left its traces in the rocks. If the rock complex has shifted or rotated in the course of the many millions of years after its formation, the tiny magnets will now point to another direction. This orientation with respect to the present North Pole is determined as accurately as possible. 314. 314. 22. 22. The sample is broken loose and marked. It is clear that any misunderstanding concerning the position in which it was found must be ruled out. By comparing the fossil direction of magnetization with the present, it is possible to reconstruct the past position of the rock with respect to the pole. This paleomagnetic research supports the theory that the continents are wandering and that they had different positions on the Earth in the past. We now know that more than 140 million years ago, a large continent existed positioned on one side of the Earth. This continent broke up in many segments that drifted here and there, sometimes over a distance of thousands of kilometers. This rock complex is only a few million years old and may perhaps provide an insight into questions such as sea level changes or the influences of ice ages and environmental circumstances. These cliffs largely consist of calcium carbonate, which was once extracted from the seawater by many millions of coralline creatures for the building of their skeletons. On closer investigation, it becomes clear that in the past, these rocks were in fact part of a coral reef. This is a fungia, a coral species that still exists today more evidence is found here, largely remains of animal species that still exist to this very day. At present, this large coral reef is situated meters above the present sea level. Once we have determined the age of these fossil corals, we then conclude how long ago these rocks were formed and how much either the land has risen since then or the sea level has dropped. Fossil coral, well preserved in the rock and of possible scientific value, is cut out and collected for further examination. In this way, this research contributes to the reconstruction of the movements that have given the Earth's crust its present shape. And gradually, we also learn more and more about the sea level changes and the evolution of coral reefs. Like the sea urchin, this well-preserved sand dollar is an echinoderm. It can still be found in many places. Not long ago, geological investigations primarily focused on land. And this for obvious reasons. Marine, or rather submarine research, requires large vessels furnished with technically and scientifically sophisticated equipment. One of the ships taking part in the Snellius II expedition is the Indonesian vessel Yalanidi, from which not only oceanographic research in open sea, but also geological investigation on land is carried out.
During the Ice Age, the sea level was more than 100 meters lower. At that time, this was a lowland, and the hills in it now form the basis for these typically tropical islands. Islands in the much deeper waters are the summits of mountains and volcanoes kilometers high. It is often thought that at these great depths, a kind of eternal peace prevails. But here too, large-scale natural phenomena occur. These events are of such dramatic violence that coasts at a distance of hundreds of kilometers can be flooded. The Dutch research vessel Tyro played an important role in the Snellius II expedition. For this purpose, the vessel had been equipped with a number of laboratory containers that could be exchanged whenever research activities required it. Topographic and geological research of oceans and deep seas is far more difficult than research on land. Exact positioning is, of course, a prerequisite. Nowadays, a high degree of accuracy can be achieved by means of several modern navigational methods. In addition, special equipment is required to obtain a proper image of the seafloor and the underlying bottom structure. A popular tool is the air gun. It transmits sound waves that can penetrate the bottom several thousands of meters. A number of air guns, suspended from a floating body, generate sharp sound pulses. Depending on the shape of the bottom profile and the difference in density of the sediment layers, the sound pulses are reflected and received on board the Tyro with different delays. The signal is amplified and registered on a recorder, which in this way presents a graphic impression of the bottom profile and the structure of the underlying sediment layers. The accumulation rate of sediment on the seafloor is as slow as some millimeters per hundreds of years. Yet, over millions of years, this can result in sediment thicknesses of hundreds to thousands of meters. The sediment layers obstruct the bedrock profile. They smooth out all irregularities, as it were, and practically fill up this entire trough. To investigate the composition of the upper sediment layers, a long tube, the so-called piston corer, is forced into the ocean bottom. At this location, the ocean is several kilometers deep, so that it takes hours before the piston core is back on board and the investigation can start. The locations of the sediment sampling stations are selected on the basis of the results of the seismic investigation. First of all, the core is subdivided into a number of segments of equal length. These are split lengthwise for a preliminary visual analysis. Colors, for instance, can provide a clue to the chemical composition. The color has to be determined as quickly as possible, for the sediments, when exposed to the atmosphere, change color very rapidly. The analysis of the piston cores is like looking back into the past. The grain size of the sediment particles provides information about the water movement at the time of the deposition. By using the fossil remains of microscopic organisms, the age of the strata can be determined. 
Recent water movements form another separate research topic in the Snellius II expedition. Indonesia marks the boundary between two oceans in which strong currents are found. Pacific Ocean water flows through the Strait of Lifamatola and enters the Banda Sea at a depth of approximately 2,000 meters. Hello, Willem, hear you, Questions that have intrigued oceanographers for many years are how fast does the water move at depth? How long does it stay in deep basins? And how long does it take before all the water in the Banda Sea is changed? One way to find the answers is measuring the current velocity. To this end, a system of three current meters, each at a different depth, is placed in the deepest part of the threshold in this strait. The current meters are equipped with magnetic tape recorders that register current velocity, directions, and temperatures at regular intervals over a longer period of time. Thus, we gain an insight into the matter of water movements. The meters are constructed in such a way that they can operate automatically at great depths for three months. All in all, though, nothing more than a moment in relation to the expected duration of the water change. Heavy weights hold the current meters in place. The destination is one of the rises that separate the deep Pacific Ocean from the Banda Sea, which is deep as well. By measuring the current velocity above the rise, the amount of water that flows into the Banda Basin within a certain span of time can be calculated. Yeah, hello Willem. Hello Willem. Now, uh, I can tell you, where's your fan even on the lier? And can you not take over? I can't take over. Hi, hi. The floats keep the instruments upright in the water. After three months, the current meters are released from the weights by means of a sound signal. The floats bring them to the surface to be picked up. During its stay in the Banda Sea, the water ages, which can be detected from the concentrations of various substances. Therefore, many measurements were carried out at the entrance and exit of the Banda Sea. Water sampling is also part of this investigation. 2900, Ruud. Thank you. Okay, Theo, let's go. We're all in short pieces, about 50 meters. This is done with a rosette sampler, a set of synthetic bottles which one after the other can take water samples at previously chosen depths. In a fixed order, eight samples are taken from the same bottle, with which eight different analyses are carried out, all concerning the age of the water. For example, the oxygen concentration. A sampling bottle is rinsed first and then filled. Chemical substances added to the water in the bottle bind all oxygen, which results in a precipitate. The browner the precipitate, the more oxygen is contained in the water. The bottles are kept under water to prevent contact with the air. Then, as quickly as possible, they are taken to one of the laboratories on board to be analyzed. Bottles of different form and size are used to prevent switching. Moreover, different analyses require different amounts of water. A reduced level of dissolved oxygen occurs in the deep part of the Banda Sea, 
resulting from consumption of oxygen by bacteria during the decomposition of organic material. At least 10 liters of seawater are required to filter out the bacteria. Then the amount of oxygen the organisms can use in a certain span of time can be determined. Once we know the differences in oxygen concentration between the entrance and exit of the band of sea, and the time taken for the reduction of that oxygen, we can determine how long it takes before the water in the band of sea is changed. Measuring the radioactivity of the carbon isotope C14 is a direct way of determining the age of the seawater. In 5,700 years, the radioactivity reduces by half. By measuring the amount of radiation left, the age can be determined. Research data show that the change of deep water in the largest part of the Banda Sea takes place in less than 40 years, which is considerably shorter than has been assumed so far. The object of all research is to obtain as much data as possible so that each may reveal something about the age and other characteristics of the water at different depths. Other objects of study are the nutrients for the phytoplankton, namely phosphates and silicates that originate from the bottom. If water change would take too long, the concentration of these substances would increase considerably. All these measurements yield water change rates of 5 to 30 years. An exception to the rule is the 6 kilometer deep Weber basin, where the process takes a little longer. The changing of deep water in basins, such as the Banda Sea, also occurs in other parts of the world oceans. This phenomenon is part of the global deep ocean circulations and hence of the entire climate system. Besides its scientific value, the study of water movements is of considerable significance with regard to social and economic issues. Growing industrialization and population density place an ever-increasing burden on the environment. This concerns the sea as well, and certainly not in the last place, since more and more waste materials are dumped in it by man. Knowledge of the causes of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions may increase the predictability of such events, and hence, increase safety. Knowledge of geological formations may advance the exploration and recovery of oil, gas, and other resources. A better understanding of the ecosystem, of deep water movements, ocean currents, and climate is of the utmost importance to navigation, fishery, and recreation, to the entire economy, and therefore, to mankind. <laughs>